So the initial thing that attracted me to Solana was the first transaction I ever made on Ethereum. Um, I think I sent myself $50 and I paid $50 to send myself $50. And so after that happened, I took a bus and I was like, wait, what just happened? <laughs> Welcome to Crypto Slam Clubhouse, brought to you by CryptoSlam.io, the multi-chain NFT and digital collectible data aggregator, collecting data since 2018. Hey y'all, welcome to episode five of Crypto Slam Clubhouse. Yes, we've made it this far. On today's show, Justin will go straight into the upcoming drops of the week. Second, Huda will get right into the NFT news of the week. And lastly, we invite Adam Slaker, our lead front-end engineer at Crypto Slam, to come on the show and just be in the clubhouse with us and talk about who's still building in the space, the different blockchains he uses, some security tips, and just kind of like the general differences and the mindset differences between collectors versus traders, entrepreneurs versus artists, and biz dev people versus and marketing people in this space, and just how we all sort of sit on the fence between all of these things, and we change our roles accordingly. So it's a great show. Thanks for tuning in. Like, like and subscribe. Have a great day. Bye. Let's get into some upcoming drops. So first, Use has quickly become one of the most anticipated NFT drops of the year. Brought to us by the creators of D-Gods, which is currently the top NFT collection on Solana and holding the number one spot on our Crypto Slam 24-hour collection rankings list. The Utes brand aims to be a revolutionary PFP collection and has many NFT enthusiasts eager to join Utopia. Recently, the collection's Twitter account has stated the official mint date is September 2nd. Next, luxury fragrance brand Sense of Wood is aiming to launch the first fragrance NFT subscription in the world. Sense of Wood is a digitally powered luxury fragrance brand inspired by forests and trees. Since 92% of their business is generated online, and two of the things they're best known for is their unique subscription model and industry innovation, many are excited about their entrance into the NFT industry. Details about their upcoming NFT subscription have not yet been released. However, you can fill out an interest form on their website today. Make sure you join our newsletter, NFTs on Deck, to stay updated on the hot up NFT drops and upcoming releases in the NFT industry. If there's a project that you'd like for us to feature as an upcoming drop, please just let us know in the comments below. And as always, make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe. Viewers of Sunday night's MTV Video Music Awards were treated to their first metaverse experience as Eminem and Snoop Dogg took to the stage as their bored apes and performed their hit new single, From the D to the LBC. This is NFT utility in action, as bored ape holders are encouraged to use their NFT's image as they see fit to build whatever they can dream of. In this case, a hip-hop supergroup represented by the hottest NFT on the market. The ENS DAO's website is suddenly up for grabs as their registration of ETH.link recently expired and will be back on sale starting on September 5th. ENS DAO is the decentralized autonomous organization that covers the Ethereum name service. They were unable to renew their lease on the site due to the leasee serving a 63-month prison sentence for helping North Koreans use cryptocurrencies to circumvent sanctions. ETH.link is expected to fetch a premium when it goes on sale soon. The Avalanche blockchain and its team have been accused of questionable business practices as hidden camera footage has perhaps revealed a strategy of tying up competitor blockchains and products in legal proceedings. Footage shows their lawyer in heavily selective clips, mentioning that these lawsuits are a way to peek into otherwise private information about the inner workings of these businesses, both on the technical and business fronts. The Avalanche team has not yet responded to questions about these new concerns, so much more info is sure to find the light of day over the next few weeks. Taco Bell and Decentraland have teamed up to offer a unique metaverse experience. Engaged couples can apply for the opportunity to win a metaverse wedding from Taco Bell that will lead to a wedding ceremony in Decentraland. Similar to getting hitched in Vegas, Decentraland's upcoming wedding ceremony is sure to open the floodgates to the hottest new way to elope. OpenSea, the largest NFT marketplace in the world, continues to see its market share slip, not just due to lower demand from NFT investors, but also from a rise in competitors like Pseudoswap, Looks Rare, and X2Y2. Contributing to the move from OpenSea is Pseudoswap and X2Y2's move to 0% marketplace fees, which could become a new industry standard. 0% fees are as disruptive as they are inevitable, so buckle up and expect a wild few months in NFTs as marketplaces and projects adjust. And that's the news of the week. 
Tune into Crypto Slams Clubhouse again next week for your weekly dose of the Web3 stories that matter the most. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Episode 5 of Crypto Slam Clubhouse. Uh, this is the legit Crypto Slam Clubhouse right now because it's all Crypto Slam people. Um, Adam is our new uh, joinee here. He's uh, one of our resident experts, uh, technical experts on our team. Uh, he's also a dad joke extraordinaire, which he posts in our Slack channels all the time. So welcome, Adam. Uh, thanks for joining Justin and Huda and I. Hey, everyone. Why don't you give us a, like, a little bit about your background, maybe throw in a dad joke in there, maybe not to put you on the spot or anything, but you know. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll start a little bit with my background. Um, been in the Web3 space since January. And when I say Web3 space, um, so I guess we're coming up on eight months now. Yeah. Uh, when I say in the Web3 space, mostly trading NFTs since January, I started trading NFTs on Solana during my paternity leave. Um, I said, hey, I've heard there's a lot of contention around NFTs. Some people say they're scams. Some people say they're the future. I finally got to this point in my software engineering journey where I said, all right, let's just take a look. Let's see what what, what it's all about. Um, dove in and started drinking the Kool-Aid pretty fast, to be honest, because I very, very quickly realized how useful uh, NFTs can be and it, how generic the technology is, right? And when you have a generic technology like that, it can be so widely applied. It's very, very exciting to see um, some of the folks, some of the builders, some of the branding people come in and say, oh, well, let's try it this way. Let's try it this way. So um, I jumped on very, very quickly. I got scammed a couple of times. I think everybody in this space has, um, but I considered it spending money on a boot camp to learn how to trade NFTs very quickly. Um, so I took the positive spin there. Um, That's a great then, attitude, by the way. Yeah, you know, it's it's you got to look at it as uh, uh, either I'm going to say I lost money or you're going to say I earned knowledge, right? That's how I look at it. Um, so after that, uh, kind of found my way to Crypto Slam. I think actually Crypto Slam found me in a way. A recruiter reached out, and it was just perfect timing. And I just hit kind of the apex of my excitement about Web three. And so, um, so I said, yeah, let's give it a shot. Kind of went through, met, met some of the folks here and, and just decided it was a really good fit and got brought on as the, the lead front end engineer, um, which is kind of, I do full stack engineering. Um, have done that at many different places in the past, some supply chain and logistics firms, some uh, educational analytics firms, but, um, but front end has always kind of been my specialty. And this is a good space. Uh, this space really needs it, in my opinion, because uh, UI and UX is going to be how we actually get people to regularly use Web3. So you're like a, I'm just going to go right into it. You're like a Solana sort of fan. And um, I've used Solana. And I would say, like, they do have great front end. Like, it's smooth. It's silky. You know, transactions are not... Uh, very abrupt uh, or you, you you get a good user experience um mm -hmm. is that what kind of attracted you to solana and uh, do you want to see that elsewhere in the web3 space <laughs> so the initial thing that attracted me to solana was the first transaction i ever made on ethereum i tried to and it was when gas was super high and i just didn't i hadn't done all the research like there's so much to learn there and so um i think i sent myself $50 and I paid $50 to send myself $50. And so after that happened, I took a bus and I was like, wait, what just happened? <laughs> and so uh, I kind of took a step back and said, hang on a second, I need to figure this out. And I think around that time, I started to do a little more research into the different chains and Solana popped up as one that said, hey, our transaction fees are super low. I started looking into, you know, they did proof of stake, they do proof of history, which is kind of an interesting piece of proof of stake. And um, and they were just able to keep those transaction fees uh, almost un like universally. I think it's like 0. 0.00005 or something like that. Someone can fact check me on that, but it's incredibly low. So you don't even think about the transaction fees when it comes to trading. So the entry point for me was significantly lower, which is why I started there. Um, it wasn't until after I started trading and messing around with Solana that I started to realize, oh, hey, there's some really, really great builders here. There's some really great uh, folks who have, who have come from UI UX backgrounds and who are building really these beautiful uh, dApps that are that are backed and and you know um, accessible only to holders in most cases. Yeah, I guess it's a it's a bit of a contrast for me because I started off on um, EOS IO technology, Wax technology, then Ethereum, and then I went to Solana, um, mm -hmm. and I definitely tested out and I did notice the UI UX was better. 
who did uh, do you have any um sort of opinions on that because i know you're you've been mostly ethereum for the last year or so yeah and, i mean and it, tezos right yeah mostly te uh, tezos but um i mean i can just you know echo what you guys are saying about how the experience looks and feels but i don't have many reps in there at all i, I might only have even like two solana nfts i think they're both gimmicks nfts um so i've not put a lot of time and attention there and, and i should i've always wanted to there's just so much going on on all these other chains so yeah there's not much i can say about solana that that would be adding to the conversation other than it's a significant chain and it's worth people's um attention justin you've dipped your toe in i i know you i have i have i'm i'm a fan of the ui ux experience on solana i'm also um, a fan of the lower gas fees, um, transactions are quick. So that, that's kind of what drew me to it as well as similar to Adam, like the, um, the entry point was a lot lower. Um, and now that the market is dipped, you know, things are more accessible on the Ethereum blockchain. So that's kind of allowed me to, to wiggle in, in ETH as well and, um, and kind of play both sides. But um, yeah, I've, been, I've enjoyed my Solana experience uh, so far and I'm really looking forward to getting into more projects in Solana. Um, it's interesting to me, though, Adam, that you say that you're, you know, from, from a builder's perspective, as an engineer, the builders are in Solana. Um, so I know you kind of came in for some of the same reasons I did, but from your expertise as a developer, like, what did you see that made you stay? Yeah, so I mean, um, obviously, I haven't had as much experience trading on Ethereum, so I'm sure there's a ton of builders there as well. Um, but it was definitely the first thing that I noticed uh, on Solana, especially as I started to look at different projects. And one of the things that I've always kind of followed, one of the rules I've always followed, at least when it comes to, hey, is a product going to be good? Is this going to be a good investment? Is I from my perspective, I follow, is it a good uh, dev experience? Do they have good devs? They have devs that uh, believe in the project. Are they building really good software? Um, so that's actually why, so for example, early on, I started investing in Polkadot, which is still kind of a long-term hold for me because I actually looked at the frameworks that they have and they have frameworks like Substrate, which makes it really, really easy to spin up your own blockchain, leveraging Rust. Um, they have, so, and when you provide a, a really, really good developer experience, their developers initially want to go there and build with it because it's really, really easy mm -hmm. to build with. Um, but uh, from the Solana perspective, there were just devs who cared. And um, again, probably exists on multiple blockchains, but um, you know, from what I started to prove, it was a little bit easier to see. And um, as we started to look at, um, at, at the different projects inside of Solana, um, I started to see some very, very interesting things crop up that started to feel to me like not just projects that were for NFTs to say, hey, it's a project, it's a branding thing, but things that would eventually become infrastructural pieces of Solana. Um, so different projects that I've been really curious about and have, have started to follow have been things like Blocksmith. Blocksmith is a big one for me. I'm a, I hold a couple of Blocksmiths, and that was one that early on, I could see that their initial plan was to build and they had a couple of ideas, but they've also pivoted really well. And the core of it is, hey, we're really good developers. We're building all the time. We're going to provide value. And some of the things that they're building are like their, their Bifrost marketplace, which is something that's that's bigger than just an, a website that allows people in. That's a, like a token gated website. That's something that's, hey, you can go buy certain things on this marketplace. Um, they are building uh, their next project coming up is Shift, which is going to be uh, a way to dynamically change the image metadata inside of an NFT, which you can do a million different things with. You know, you could age your uh, NFT over time. You could replace uh, traits of your NFT um, with in-game items that you want, things like that, right? So you can actually reflect some of the things that you want in-game. And so um, I've seen a lot of pieces like that where they're not saying, they're not trying to build the end product. They're, they're, they're taking a couple of meta steps back where they're saying, what is the deepest lever that we can pull to actually have the most influence and, and cause the most change. And so they're providing tool sets for other projects to then say, oh man, I'm gonna go use Blocksmith's tools to then build our new project, right? I've seen a lot of that on, on Solana, which is these, these deep down, these, these core pieces that are represented by NFTs and holders get access to some of these pieces. Uh, but for example, another one is, is Soul Decoder and they provide bots for DAOs so they're providing tools for other NFT projects, right? So it's, again, taking that meta step down to say, 
how do we provide tool sets for other NFT projects and become something that everybody relies on, right? Now they're just a, a, a cornerstone of the Solana NFT space. Um, that's why I got really interested in it because I wasn't seeing just projects where, hey, we have a website, we've got a token. If you stake your thing, you get a token and sometimes you can buy merch, right? That to me feels like an end member project. Whereas uh, uh, some of these other projects are, how do we support those projects that want to just create a token and have their, their, their website and have their merch? You know, if I look at the, um, the Crypto Slam homepage right now, we see um, Ethereum, Solana, Immutable X, Flow, Ronin, BNB, Polygon, Panini, Wax, Tezos, Arbitrum, Palm, Avalanche, and um, some more. So one of the things that we always get hit up on social media and and in the community is like are you playing favorites and and it's not something that we do like uh adam himself he's a solana guy who does uh ethereum and tezos guy justin's a solana and ethereum guy i'm a wax uh solana ethereum tezos so i try them all and that's something that we all try to do uh we all go where the the collections are that we we sort of like want to try out and it's it's nothing on our team we're just kind of like fans of of, of things who kind of talk to me about what it is that you particularly like about tezos for example oh boy that's interesting it, it, it's it's something that eth typically prides itself on which is community i just kind of fell in love with the community and and maybe because it's so art focused um so yeah maybe it's both of those really it's it's the quality of the art and it is the community but the reason i said community first is the the quality of art it wasn't there to start it was awesome art but it wasn't you know kind of world class you know genre pushing art like we're seeing today maybe there were a little hints of it back then um today it's totally different ethereum had that type of art back then and now um and now Tezos has taken that baton and really run with it. So I just, I like the experience. I do like the cheaper, you know, transaction fees. That part's great too. And you can get that on a bunch of blockchains now. Um, so it is specifically the community for me. It, it's a great group of people who are in it, you know, not, not with profit as the focus. It's collecting. And um, yeah, it's just the, the spirit of Tezos is different than, than Ethereum. And I still love Ethereum. I guess that's still, you know, my number it's still really my number one where I've done the most, but Tezos is where, you know, I just have a passion for. Adam, are you like that with anything? Any, any collections? Any specific collections of um, just things I'm, I'm passionate about or things that I, things that I track? Yeah, both, I guess, on, on Solana or Ethereum, uh, Solana. So uh, early, yes, there, I'm actually, I actually have my, my wallet open here so I can remind myself of all the things that I really love about Solana because I don't want to leave any of these things out. Um, some, of, one, some of my earliest entry ones, um, and, and I actually will you know, kind of bounce off of, of what Yehuda said there is, that was another thing that brought me in really early too was, was community. And uh, I think that's starting to exist in a lot of different places. Um, and that is a really, really important uh, aspect and, and something that, I think when it's focused on and nurtured and and frankly, you know, managing a Discord and moderating a Discord is huge when it comes to that, right? Um, if you create a community that kind of stands on its own, uh, it's it's it becomes an asset of the NFT project. So you can almost a, a, akin to the utility of the project itself, right? right? Um, especially when you get access to some of those channels through you know being a holder or something like that. Um, one of the earliest communities I got involved in um, on Solana was the Skeleton Crew, um, which was, the, they're this really, really cool, um, the artist, uh, I think it's A-O or I-O, that's A-Y-Y-O, um, he created a number of these skulls, skulls with these different features, really, really cool. Um, and I got into it late, but essentially they created this, they, they minted in, I think, September of last year, they wanted to have it ready for October, and they did a free art airdrop every day of October um, to like random holders, which I thought was really, really cool. And their whole thing initially was support of one of one art 
on Solana. Um, and so what they did is they would actually bring artists in, they would help them bootstrap a website, bootstrap a platform, help them do their mint. Uh, holders of skulls would get access to whitelist. Um, and so it was just a really, really cool system in which they were using these skulls and this community that it, they'd originally created with a number of builders to then support one of one art. Um, and then those artists always come back and just say, man, this is so great. And then they, they you know, they, they send other artists their way. Um, and then in addition, you've got a ton of uh, developers working in there who are just passionate about it. And it's probably one of the best channels to go into to ask questions about how do I build on Web3. Um, so that was one of my favorite communities to get involved with early on. And it was probably one of my first, I'll consider like big purchases for myself. At the time, it was like 0.7 or, or one soul, but that was also back when soul was like 120. Um, so, you know, I, I got into that. I think at this point I'm holding like eight skulls um, just because I, I love them and uh, I, I love that community. Justin, like um, I, I see a lot of this in the wax uh, ecosystem as well. You, you, you met Shnazi at NFT NYC and um, she talked about that on one of our last calls. Like we're seeing builders still around in the bear market, not everywhere. And, but they're there and they're not only in one place, they're in, in multiple places. So what can you tell us about like what you saw from the wax side of things? Sure. Um, community, honestly, is, is, is at the heart of it. It's the lifeblood of, of the Web3 ecosystem. And so I think any project, any blockchain, even having a strong community um, is, is extremely important, I think increasingly important. Um, so after talking to Snazzy, initially meeting Snazzy at, uh, at NFT NYC, they had an amazing booth right next to OpenSea's booth um, with, and honestly, they, you could tell they invested a lot in, uh, in the booth itself, but also in the conversation and the people and in the projects that they were supporting as well. So not just some of their top projects, but even some of their artists also. Um, so it was, it was really cool to see, um, it was, it's, it's really cool to see like when when a large corporation or large brand not just supports the the bigger brands that are partnering with it, but also the little guy too. Um, and so what I really liked and uh, what I'm appreciating more and more about the WAX community is that they revolve the conversation and they constantly think about what is what does our community need? What do they care about? You know, for a while it was just, uh, you know, when the, when the bear market hit, for example, um, a lot of the conversation was, you know, how do we stay motivated? Um, what can we do for you type of conversation? So they started doing Wax Wednesdays, which every single Wednesday they come on and do Twitter spaces and they bring on a member that can add value to their community in some way. Crypto Slam was uh, also uh, was, was uh, happy to partner with them for a Wax Wednesday in the past. And I'm sure we'll do more in the future. But it was just great to see and great to be a part of that community. Um, and it's it was a very community centric approach to marketing. Um, and uh, just trying to figure out how can we provide value, I think was uh, was an awesome was an awesome takeaway for me. Um, and I'm seeing that more and more. It's not just um, yes, there's a lot of builders, um, which is fantastic, um, and I'm seeing. But also, it's really like, okay, what are are we building things? Are we building the community? Um, and what direction are we going? When and are we are we making sure that we're building stuff that our communities actually care about? Um, and so that said, I, I'm interested in like this. Uh, when it comes to NFTs, um, it seems that we have the, the collectors and then the traders, and then some people are like in this hybrid role. And so I wanted to ask you all, I'm sure there are tools for, for each, but I wanted to ask you all, what do you all identify as? I guess, Johan, you can go first. Are you a collector? Are you a trader? Are you a little bit of both? Yeah. Um, you know, when we first, when I first started getting into this thing, I was a collector. And I said to myself, I'm going to play the long game here. I'm going to get stuff and I'm going to collect it and I'm going to hold. And then eventually I realized, man, you can flip these things. And uh, <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah. well, I can, this, this brings in another dimension. So I became a little bit of both. And I guess you have to know what is a trade and what is a collect, like what is collecting. Don't get me wrong. The stuff you collect, you eventually want to, you know, sell maybe one or two of those one day but sometimes the, there's certain pieces that you're like i'm never getting rid of this i just love it for the story just the fact mm -hmm. that it, it's this or it's that um so i'm a bit of both for sure and it's hard to distinguish a, a, a transaction um whether it's something i want to hold or or uh or um or collect because i guess you have to and, and who do i see who to smile and like uh nodding there because 
there's a price that people will sell for. You just have to know what it is, right? And um, I, I think you battled with that too as well, Huda, right? Yeah, it's a it's a game. And and my take on it, it this is me, I, I'm an opportunist and, and I happen to love technology and I love collecting and I do love trading. So it's whatever, whatever feels right at the moment. It's just being smart about it. So we're just lucky to be playing in such a cool um a cool scene that's experiencing so much growth that gives us the opportunity to do all of those things and to have so many, so many chances to, to do either side of it, to collect, to trade, you know, whichever it's just, it's, it's a playground. Um, even though it's been, you know, it's slowing down and the scene has changed a bit. It's there's still those opportunities to do both sides of those things. Adam, what about yourself? I'd probably put myself right in the, I, I actually like the way that, that Huda put it, uh, I'm an opportunist as well. I would say I often follow the rule of three when it comes to oh. something that I think is a good utility, right? So um, I'll buy three of them and I'll sell one to cover the cost of the three if it gets to that point. And then I'll hold the other two and then I'll sell the second one when I think it's gotten to a point where it's just at a really, really great price. And then the third one I typically hold and almost like it would have to be a very high price for me to get rid of it just because for the most part, I want, I get access to a utility through that. If I sell it, I don't have access to that anymore. Um, I've done that with a number of things. There are a couple of things that I wish I would have done the rule of six or nine or 15 at the time <laughs> because they've done so well. Uh, and I, you know, I sold the first one to, I mean, Blacksmith Labs is a great example that I bought three. I sold the first one when I covered the cost of all three. Um, and then they, they spiked a couple of times and now I'm hesitant to even sell the two because their staking rewards are so great. So, um, but I, I, I think I definitely collect uh, and then occasionally I'll do some short-term, long-term, even scalping plays, depending on um, using some of the, like the actual trading tools that I've uh, acquired since, you know, being part of additional projects. Um, I think I, I firmly sit mostly on the collector side though, especially within the past two weeks, I've really started to collect a lot more one-of-one -one art as well. Interesting. Justin, we'll, we'll play that back to you. What are you? What are you? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm big about taking healthy gains uh, for sure. So, um, but that said, I, I find myself in the middle as well. Like I'm falling in love with this space. And so there are just some projects and some, some communities that I just want to stay a part of and I have my eyes on joining um, and I don't imagine, you know, selling those. Um, yeah, so I, I, I find myself in a little bit, uh, yeah, more so in the middle, I'd say. I guess I'm an opportunist as well. I hadn't thought about it like that until Huda so eloquently put it like that. But I, yeah, I think I would identify as that as well. Um, yeah, I'm big about staying in the green, but at the same time, um, yeah, there, there are projects that I, I, I imagine once I, once I get a hold of, I don't plan on selling. I, I think too, Johan, I think like, it's interesting. I think the longer you're in this space and getting reps and trading and whatever you initially, you know, set out to do, I think you can't help but turn into a, a true collector at some point because there's so much time that we put into this and you do get attached to some of these things and there will be inevitably something will come along that you love and you have do, to have and you're never going to get rid of it. So do you we'll ever, all be collectors. Do you ever become more of a collector when you see or come across somebody else who's just like a diamond hander? Like there's some people that I know that if I sell this to them, I'm never getting it back. And it, it, it happened to yeah. me, like I sold a, a Shohei Otani on the wax ecosystem uh, on, on the, the MLB um, release there. And I'm like, man, I'm getting a good deal on this, but I'm never getting that back. So it's mm. like, you know, you become more of a collector of certain things because you just know there's other collectors like that out there. That's it. And it's just a growing number of them too. That's what, it's something special about the space that we're in it so early that we're going to have all of those opportunities, I think still. Yeah, I will say that one one additional piece that I've started to look at recently has been selling at a price because because if you're in it long enough, you can get a pretty decent idea of, of what the, the the hills and the valleys are going to start to feel like. And you're never I mean, it's never 100 percent accurate, but you also accrue enough of these tools, again, some of these utilities that help you predict some of those things um, that I have gotten in the habit of saying, OK, I don't want to get rid of this, but this price is way too good. And I'm pretty confident 
that within the next month, it's going to come back down to that price and I'll buy back in. Right. And so you've made a little bit of gain on top of that. There are a couple, it's always a gamble, but there's a couple of times that I've done that saying, Hey, I really want to hold this, but this is too good to pass up. And frankly, I want to reinvest those gains into some additional projects. Yeah. Experience is a hell of a thing and it does work. If you, if you put that time in and you should, yeah, you should like kind of review your moves and learn from it because then you do Adam, like you just said, you, you know, these trends and you know how things typically move and man, you can just play so much better. And then I'll go back to being an opportunist. You have many more opportunities to then collect because you know, you understand it differently. Yeah. I'll probably just blow it all in one of one art anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Awesome. That that uh, that kind of leads me to my next question. What what tools do you all find most valuable when it comes to collecting, trading, and those types of things? Yeah, I don't I don't use any personally. I mean, I, not not that I can think of. Um, yeah, I'll let the other guys answer. Maybe that'll kind of jog my memory. But I just uh, yeah, I, I keep it pretty basic. I mostly Discord and Twitter, and then obviously Crypto Slam just to find out what's happening, what's the, what's moving, what's what, what's where's the volume at so it's discord and twitter for me yeah I, I definitely use healthy amounts of discord and twitter however i i think i i use lots of tools <laughs> at this point and <laughs> uh, and i think that's because i've really some of it is because i'm a developer and so initially it was out of curiosity that i explored some of these things say wow how did you build this? This is great. What, what, you know, and then thinking about how did they, how are they parsing the data off the blockchain? How are they storing this locally? How are they, how are they making such a smooth experience? Uh, but there were honestly, that's some of my favorite NFT projects to look for and vet out and then inevitably buy into on the, on the Solana blockchain are ones that give me utility. Um, and initially it was ones that you gave me utility in purchasing more NFTs, which Unfortunately, there if in a bear market, if something is just giving utility on purchasing NFTs, they're going to follow the trajectory of the value of the actual NFTs that they're helping you uh, purchase. So, um, you know, eventually, I want to move into like what are these in real life utilities, and there are some interesting ones coming along there. But I do have a lot that I use. Um, Smart C Society is a big one for me. I, I hold two of their NFTs, and frankly, I want to hold five. Um, but they have, they do artificial intelligence models to um, take a look at, they'll, they'll essentially ping the, the um, well, they have a couple of bots as well, but they actually have an application and they'll, they'll send a ping out that says, hey, there's a 95% chance that this collection is going to go up by 40% in the next, you know, five days or so. And so you start to look at it, you don't buy in right away, you start, you know, doing your research, um, you take a look at their graphs, they have some great, they actually have an entire YouTube series about using their tool to purchase, which I think is really, really cool. Um, but they have, they call out these trends, they call out if, okay, if listed items is going down, and if, and if Twitter mentions were up just before that, it's a pretty good chance that the floor price is going to go up here and you can flip in the short term. Um, they even went as far as introducing scalp signals, which are, hey, you can make a profit within 24 hours. You know, none of it's a guarantee. And they, they, that's why they have the YouTube videos to say, here's how you would do your research. Um, and then they also bring up other tools like Hello Moon to look at what are the smart, uh, what are the whale wallets on Solana? purchasing right now the ones that the smart money is what they call it um, and then comparing that with their tools um, so i've really really enjoyed that quite a bit they recently introduced a floor price predictor which has it you know if it's got at least seven days of data um, they will start showing you trends on where the floor price could end up being um, and frankly people have been making really good trades with it i think that's been for me if i'm going to be doing some like shallow uh short-term trades to just like up my gains to buy into maybe another project that I that I want to hold for much longer. I'll typically use them and I'll start looking at scalp signals and things like that. Um, so I've enjoyed that quite a bit. And then there's other portfolio uh, I, um, like holders like that. Uh, Net runners one though. I'll, I actually want to come back to that later because there's there's more to them than just portfolio. Soul decoder is another one I mentioned before. They actually parse through a bunch of like top tier discords and uh, and they. So like high floor price discords, folks that we know are, are making good trades and you can literally go to their site and search for 
of some collection and it'll bring out all the discord messages that have talked about it recently and you can start to go through and say okay oh okay these people are saying this these people are really excited the number of mentions uh in the discord bumped up over the past couple of days um so i love little tools like that like piecing together this little suite of tools between different nft projects to kind of help me uh, mostly if i'm going to be doing trading um, and then collecting is discord and twitter jump into the discord see what i think about the community um, see if it's something I want to hold or be a part of in the long term. Yeah, speaking of which, I think um, people can do a lot with data that, that's been crawled off the blockchain. And, uh, you know, we released, we just released our API. And uh, I think people can find a lot out of use, use out of that data. We're crawling almost 18 blockchains now, uh, more to come. And uh, you can do what you want with our API. So check it out. Um, I want to go back to also like, that blurred line i love that idea of the, of you that blurred line between a collector and a trader and do you also think like there's blurred lines between um oh and by the way somebody's uh, phone is uh, buzzing there um if there's a blurred line between uh on the collector side between being an entrepreneur being an artist and also being a dev like sometimes these <laughs> you have devs who, who try and be entrepreneurs and also artists as well. Like, can anybody speak to that a little bit? I mean, there's, there's definitely the space is, is growing. Definitely. It's a very entrepreneurial space. Um, but how have you seen collections that do things well and handle all of these different parts? Man, that's a meaty question. <laughs> Um, I don't know. Can you ask it again? I just want to make sure that I was clear on it. Is there a good, is there a right way to do it? Because there's definitely uh, competencies that need to be done well within a project. You definitely need to be a good entrepreneur on the business side. Mm. You definitely need to be a good artist. And you also need to have devs as well that do these things. And sometimes these projects, they start off as one man teams or, or, or two man right. teams and they, they grow and they, they get big. And now they have to handle all of these competencies. Have you seen any projects that have done it well? And, gotcha. you know. I mean, is that something like Moonbirds? Cause there's not many of them that have done it well. I mean, just being very, <laughs> very honest, I, I think there's, I mean, could probably count on one hand how many can, can do that at, to the degree that you have to, you know, to grow something that as big as we think they're gonna get like that board ape level. I mean, maybe they're an example of it. Um, Maybe like V friends. B friends is a great one. And it maybe, dude, maybe it's just those three and maybe, you know, pixel vault being a fourth. There's not a lot of guys like that, that, that really it's a total package. Um, and some of them, even though they have the total package, they're still not a really, you know, I still struggle sometimes to see what the product is other than a brand and a brand is certainly a product, but I think that just speaks to how hard it actually is to do. And, well, and I mean, for example, on the Tezo side, the tech is being taken care of by the devs but then the art is just exceptional, right? Like the, the, the artists are just off the, like they just do what they do really well. And sometimes they don't really have to deal with the tech side. Right, no, that's a good point. I guess what's interesting on, on Tezos too is with generative art being so big, you have these super technical guys that are doing the art and building the platforms right. at the same time, which is really, really wild. So I guess the, the thing that I've seen, um, well, let's, let's take it back a step. I've seen it not done well. I think there are many ways to do it right, but I think it's. I think oftentimes what is missed is this unique um, Venn diagram, right? Where you have you have brand or, or someone who's into marketing, uh, design, uh, the front end, whatever that art, and then you have developers, you have builders, right? Um, I don't think there's a middle ground to that Venn diagram. I don't think someone can be all three of those things, but I think you can have multiple people who can be two of those things. What I've seen done wrong most of the time, and maybe this is just my own personal experience and, and why I, you know, I do think developers are an important piece, is either you start early with brand and design and art, and you say after Mint, we're gonna use those Mint funds to hire developers. Personally, I think that's a bad trajectory because if you're going to wait until after Mint to hire developers, but you've already created a roadmap, you haven't asked any developers how long <laughs> that roadmap is going to take. 
So oftentimes what happens is that roadmap gets pushed out, pushed out, pushed out. And frankly, it's difficult to find good developers on the fly because you have to then onboard them onto your project, explain to them your domain, what are the things that you're actually working on? You need to get them kind of bought in a little bit. It, you know, they don't actually have to physically buy in, but they have to at least say, hey, this is a great idea. I want to, I want to work on this. Um, and then on the flip side, I've seen projects that went full development upfront, just building product led, but actually didn't get a ton of marketing involved. Yeah. And um, in those cases, they've got a ton of great tools and no way to get it out there. You know, not as many people know about them. There's not a, a constant um, dialogue on Twitter. Um, so I think I think a combination of those two things being available from the start is super, super important. Yeah, well, well said, well said. It can go both ways, right? Like you can be really good at the tech, really good at the art. And I guess that's where you guys are talking about in the end is th this community. We can't raise what is the saying about raising a child it, it takes a village to raise a child right so it takes a it takes a community to raise a good project and i think um you know that's why we see in certain communities like you will have developers that can help you um get to a certain competency level and then you have but you need to have the the excellence in the art too as well and you need to have excellence on the brand as well too so it's a, it's a good conversation guys um where do you guys want to take it from here uh, I, I have one more question because we were talking about trading and I know we had a, a lunch and learn about this, but just real quick, um, can you all provide some tips for anyone who's looking to trade, uh, but obviously wants to do so securely, you know, in the year of 2022, um, in the first four months, 52 million was lost in NFT scams, um, which is really unfortunate. So I think, you know, just to be responsible on our side, can you all give some tips regarding um, how to trade responsibly, if that's something you're looking to get into? I'll push that one over to Adam. Like, <laughs> yeah, you, well, if you had to boil it down, what would you say are the top three things or top five things? Okay, let me start it off with I, I'm not a security expert. Um, you know, it's kind of the whole, uh, this is not financial advice, <laughs> but um, I've spent enough time in this space now and just, just looking at some of the basic security pieces where I think I've got a, a, a decent idea of, of some of the, the best things you can do here. Uh, my number one thing across the board is get a hardware wallet. My number two thing is get a hardware wallet. Honestly, go get a hardware wallet. Um, even if it's not the one that you're using on a daily basis, it's totally fine to have a mix of hot wallets and, and hardware wallets. But if you are going to be holding things long-term, put it in a hardware wallet. The reason for that is your private key, which is the most important part that anybody talks about, the thing that you actually use to sign your transactions never leaves your device, right? And so. The most recent, and, and I, you know, you guys are, are well aware of this. We did this lunch and learn. Um, the most recent Solana hack happened because there were imported keys from the Slope wallet. And the Slope wallet had, they had had some security practices that weren't the best behind the scenes. They'd sent some, some plain text seed phrases. Uh, folks were able to then derive private keys. Um, and that was just that it was all downhill from there. They were essentially able to figure out how to sign transactions out of other people's wallets. Um, the reason that never happens with the hardware wallet and specifically, you know, I'm using a ledger, but it, there's many different hardware wallets out there is your seed phrase and your private keys get created on your hardware wallet and they're never actually communicated to a server. So that particular, uh, practice that occurred there would never be an issue on a hardware wallet. Um, so that's kind of my, my first couple of tips there that I think are really important. Um, I'd say tip number three, um, if you are using a hot wallet, be aware of how it works. Um, so for example, and actually tip number three is a wallet is not a wallet, right? It doesn't hold your NFTs, it holds your private keys. Uh, so if really a wallet is more of a keychain. It is the way that you're able to tell everybody else interacting with the blockchain that, hey, those things on the blockchain, those are mine. Um, knowing that, that means that in order to sign something out of your wallet, you have to physically do that. So if you have a scam NFT that ends up in your wallet, that scam NFT can't drain your wallet. That's not a thing. You actually still have to trigger some sort of signature coming out of your wallet. Now, that being said, what often happens is there's a link with that scam NFT and someone ends up on that page. And then that page asks you to sign a transaction or something like that. And then you have signed something out of your wallet. Um, that kind of leads me to my fourth point. If you are minting, use a separate wallet for minting. That is something that can be problematic on a hardware wallet. 
Um, so for example, and this is especially true if you're using a platform that is not a well-vetted platform like OpenSea or Magic Eden or, and, and frankly, this is why a lot of these platforms are becoming the de facto standard uh, because people trust them and we know that there, there, there's um, uh, some insurance there in a way. Um, if someone is running a mint on their own site, that's fine. It's a branding thing. It's, it's great. Um, send funds to a separate hot wallet that are, you're going to then use to mint from there. The reason for that is because behind the scenes, you don't know the instructions that are part of your transaction, right? So you're gonna say mint and on the site, it says mint for, I'm just gonna use Solana as my example, mint for 1.5 soul. But behind the scenes, that doesn't mean the transaction that you're signing reflects that, right? And so um, if you say mint for 1.5 soul and all of a sudden you're missing 40 soul, well, that's kind of a problem and you're never gonna get that back. And the reason for that is somewhere in that transaction, they had hidden an instruction that says, take more soul than what we're actually selling it for. That could happen on a hardware wallet as well because you're still signing the transaction. If you signed it, well, then you, you said it's okay to take this stuff out. So I often will send funds, I'll, and honestly, that keeps me from minting too many as well. Um, I'll send you know nine soul to myself and say, okay, I'm just gonna mint four of these or five of these. Um, so I think that's a really, really important one as well. Um, Honestly, the fifth one is change your passwords often. Mm -hmm. That's it. The passwords that access your wallets, just change them often. And that's that's a common security practice across the board. Um, but just just do it. It's it's not too bad to change them every every month, every couple months. You know, it's 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 normally just to stop folks from accessing your your wallet if they're actually on your laptop itself. But it's an easy practice to follow. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of the space is just people not understanding some of those core things there. So yeah, you're responsible for your keys um, and what you sign. So guys, uh, thank you so much, Adam. You're welcome back on again. You're a pleasure to have on and I'm sure you can uh, join us on another conversation like this. So thank you so much. And uh, you guys have a nice day. Thanks for having me, guys. Of course, take care. Crypto Slam has some of the most comprehensive data in the NFT industry. Contact us today to find out more about our free and enterprise API. Thanks again for tuning in.